we see in the chart talks about many markets in Asia. On the floor here, we, talk, we hear about many markets. But a question that comes again and again is, is, is well, China is big. And, and to try to understand how big it is, actually yesterday at one of the presentations, someone lined up the various provinces with various countries in the world. And then I couldn't resist to take the same chart and actually go back and, and read it a little bit. Because they use nominal dollars, and I wanted to use PPP given the currency distortions uh, in the region. And also they use as a benchmark countries from around the world, and I thought I should use for this audience can countries in Asia. So this is what I did this morning. Um, the web is a wonderful um, <laughs> tool. Thank you, Google and, and uh, Wikipedia. Um, but trying to line up on the left-hand side, uh, 2010 GDP across Chinese provinces. Uh, and on the right-hand side, I took um, Asian countries that we, we hear about, or Asian economic regions that we hear about uh, at this conference. And, and sure, South Korea is bigger in itself than any of the provinces in China. But then you see, um, before you get to a province as big as uh, Malaysia, you have to go down to the number nine. And so the nine provinces in China, sorry, that have a bigger economy uh, than Malaysia. And to me, this was telling uh, in terms of what does it mean for China to be big? What does it mean for the economies of those provinces to be sizable e economies? And so when we talk about diversification strategies from a real estate point of view, um, one thing I've noticed this year at MIPAM Asia compared to the past year is, you know, and it was true listening to you just now, mm -hmm. is all these new Chinese names we got to learn every year we come here, and it gets more complicated every year, mm -hmm. because they are very sizable regional economies mm -hmm. um, in China. And, you know, from a real estate investment strategy point of view. Mm. You know, we talked about New Zealand. In New Zealand, you know, it, it is a very tiny uh, economy. So that was just a simple data exercise. Um, so wh what are the key messages that we get? And, you know, listening to you and listening to, to Megan and you here, is there's a sense in which the easy, easy money is over. And I think a, an example of that is the, the loss of interest in pan-Asian funds. I mentioned earlier that people wanting more specific strategies. Um, descending investor is one who's going to pay attention within China as to where they invest. Maybe interesting indicators or critical indicators to pay attention to before driving real estate uh, funds to investments is the performance of the local government. There's an extreme heterogeneity in the balance sheet of this government, in the ability of this government to take the funding that was released to tackle the crisis and to take that funding and channel it towards productive projects versus just white elephants. Um, and maybe one indicator that that's worth looking at across provinces, across metropolitan area, is the strength of the small and medium enterprises. Because this is where the entrepreneurial spirit shows up, this is where innovation uh, shows up. And maybe the, the strength or the growth of the service sector would be the type of indicator I would look for in trying to think about diversification strategies within, within China. Mm -hmm. And then within the region, um, clearly how secure, how efficient the business environment is has been a key driver of, of investment or, or a key a preventer of, of investment, key roadblock. The trade flows with China clearly matters. And then I heard a, a panelists make the point about the importance of the local Chinese community. And the point went as follows, is if there's gonna be any trouble within China, you would expect that there might actually be capital flow out of China, and where would this capital flow? It's likely to flow to, to metropolitan areas in the Asia-Pacific region, which have strong local Chinese community, with capital, capital being channeled from the fa within the families from China to those, to those communities. So I thought those were interesting indicators for the discerning investor. And then, then stepping back as, as an economist, I asked myself about th this role the government play. Right, we heard from you about you know, repeated interventions, fine-tuning of what's happening in the economy. Right? With the setup in China, they have many more levers than we have in, in Europe than we have in, in the USA. Um, in this emerging market, there is really an imperative to act on. I won't repeat it. I just mentioned it already. Um, within China, you know, this first stage of growth, in a sense, it's, it's kind of easy to manage from a government. I mean, not, not all of them get it right. I mean, you got to get this infrastructure right and the legal environment right. But, but it's really the first stage of growth is about shifting resources from one productive sector towards a more productive sector. 
so there's not much to it except allowing and facilitating that shifting of resources and allowing the enterprises within the more productive sector to, to flourish, giving them the right environment. So that, that's easier to manage, that's easier to plan. If I have one concern, it's about the sustainability of this growth. But we know by definition that simply growing out of allocation, reallocation of resources is not sustainable because at some point you do get to the balanced growth path that we call the you know, service, manufacturing, agricultural split that you see in most developed economies. And so eventually, growth becomes a story about R&D. Eventually, growth becomes a story about innovations. And, and maybe the Chinese government will teach something to the rest of the world. But we know this. We know that both in Europe and in the USA, and in other developed economies, governments have never been good at picking the winners. That when it comes to driving innovation, to, to harvesting the, the product of research and development, when it comes to improving total factor productivity, really the success stories, they come out of environment where people are allowed to innovate on their own. And usually it's within a free market, where we let people grow, we let people fail. Right? And, and we are far from there. And, and so to me, the, the key question I'm left with is in thinking about th those long-term fundamentals that are driving growth in, in China. You know, the, there was a crisis, and the, the Chinese government had to intervene, and has been quite successful uh, at moving things forward and keeping the economy going. But in doing so, at least put a halt to the market reforms that were happening up to 2008. And if anything, what we hear on MIPAM is, in, in doing so also because of the way they channeled the funds, you know, probably there were some sectors that were more privileged than others, and maybe the bigger firms were more privileged than the smaller firms. And we hear about issues with uh, cre providing credit to small, small businesses. And I think there's a key issue to face now, besides the issues that you mentioned, the, mm -hmm. the constantly changing fine tuning of regulation. Mm -hmm. At the big picture level, it's about whether the government's gonna be ready to, to bring back the pace of reforms toward freer market, to unleash this innovation, and provide the environment for Chinese entrepreneurs to rise and to have the next apple come out of, of, of China. And to me, that, that, that's a big question for, for the future. So, so in the end, we, we mentioned at the start, cautious optimism. Mm. We asked you, and we ask this question every year, we, we can't resist, is how has Metamedia changed your outlook? <laughs> Be it the interactions on the booth or the interactions over the lunches and in the, in the conferences. Mm. And what I've noticed is there are always a few grumpy people. <laughs> Right? Wherever you go in the world, there are always a few grumpy people. And, and therefore, ignore those 5%. And I feel <laughs> sorry for them. We should offer them a beer. Um, but but um, the people whose opinion change, for the most part, are people who became more optimistic. Um, I want to leave you with, with my, what I found the most satisfying and interesting this year. Um, it's those outstanding award-winning projects that we mm. had. It's the first time between them, so you, you might not know that MIPAM in Cannes, which is more European and Middle Eastern focus and, and somewhat American, um, they run awards there, in the same way the same company runs awards here for MIPAM Asia. And this is the first year where they had more submissions for those awards in Asia than they had in Europe. And, I mean, this is about the, the amount of activity that is taking place here, and that explains why all these architects are here with us. And there are fascinating projects taking place in this part of the country, and I wish more of them would come to, to my part of the country, be it <laughs> Europe or, or America. Um, the Marina Bay Financial Center is uh, the project which won the most votes across all categories from the participants of MIPAM Asia. So it's a participant's choice project. And since I'm the speaker, I got to pick my own uh, <laughs> preferred. And, and the Shanghai Shimo, uh, Shimao Wonderland Intercontinental Hotel, what you see there is a five-star hotel being built in a former quarry, so mm. in a hall. Mm. with what are at the bottom. And, and, and if there is anyone here from these companies and they want me to be a keynote speaker at that hotel for opening day, I'd love to come. If I can bring <laughs> my family, it's even better. But it looks like a fascinating uh, pr uh, project. So, so with this, um, thank you very much for, for taking the time to come in and listen to us. And I think we have a bit of time uh, for your questions. If you mind raising your hand, there's a microphone moving around the room. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
it's always amazing uh, to come to this part of the world and to sort of see the activity and scale that uh, provincial Europe and provincial North America and Latin America mm -hmm. don't even conceptualize, etc. Um, there has to be another economic measure other than size uh -huh. and growth because we we tend to ignore local distinctive qualities of Malaysia and Korea, mm -hmm. etc. We're just constantly sucked in by the uh, the enamor of 1.x billion people and, mm -hmm. and all rational thinking sort of goes out the window because you can simply multiply some sort of penetration rate mm -hmm. by 1.5 billion and always end up with the same conclusion that it must be China. Um, smaller and more specialized entities around the world have larger voices in the human endeavor mm -hmm. from a resistance movement in Norway mm -hmm. to a, uh, a, a minority position of, in some mm -hmm. other part. Um, this part of the world doesn't celebrate the individual voice and, mm -hmm. and eventually I read the difference between where are you all mm -hmm. in China and how are you looking at it mm -hmm. not too well as this sort of disconnect between um, making money in the capitalist model mm -hmm. and wondering about the voice or the abdication of principles that we're doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make money in this part of the world, et cetera, mm -hmm. sort of thing. So I'm, I'm wondering how the, the Toledo, Ohio's of China sort of grow up to a distinctive voice mm -hmm. uh, or present themselves as, as a distinctive voice beyond simply being labeled uh, third tier mm -hmm. city number 203. Um, so what, maybe not as an economist, Francois, mm -hmm. but which, which other part of the University of Wisconsin do we, yeah. do we call uh, <laughs> upon to try to explain this part of the world? Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and, then, um, and I'm not sure that's a question. So. Yeah, well, the, the, and I, I'm, I'd love to go at length and explain to everybody why the University of Wisconsin reference made perfect sense given the values of our university, but, but maybe this is not the place uh, now. But maybe, you know, to get, to get at your point, I that's why I put that, that bullet point, the growing service sector. Uh, listening to a panelist uh, yesterday who was talking about, uh, maybe not the Toledo, but you know, when we talked about the different regions and different cities around uh, China, and this is someone who's been traveling to a variety of places to the, what we might call third tier, I don't know if it, a fourth tier exists, mm -hmm. and, and talking about how some of these cities were really trying to play a differentiated card. And he thought the differentiation was actually in the growth of the high quality service sector. So cities that who are thinking about the well-being of their people and thinking about master plan communities with leisure opportunity and quality of life. Which, 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 which sounded, I don't know much about Toledo, but it sounded very much like Madison, Wisconsin, where whenever we plan a community, the first thing we do in Madison, Wisconsin, we put the park for the children, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and I think this is what I find interesting this year is that this year, the conversation about diversity within China is more than just, I got to get out of Shanghai because there are too many people, so I'm going to go to Chengdu mm. or Chongqing. Mm. Um, this year, the, the conversation is, is more about, I mean, there's so many other places. And within these places, there are interesting stories. And, and that's why also, you know, when I talk about the performing local government, that there are places where there are very big differences in the ways that local government are thinking about the welfare of their people. And, 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 you know, the kind of criteria you talk about might be useful criteria to talk about the sustainability, not just from an environmental point of view, but in terms of the, the social mix and the social equilibrium, and therefore useful criteria for investment performance. And, and, and I think it's the first time this year that I heard the conversation go all the way there. This is simply, you know, it's big and too tense in Shanghai, let me go to. So, so I think we're getting there. Let, let's see what next year bring on, on, on this front. But, but you might have different I'd, perspectives. I'd, I'd, <coughs> I'd quite like to add to that that uh, I've got two points I'd like to add. Um, one is in terms of looking at where we might go next. Is, what we're seeing is that cities which are based around energy, commodities, or technology, and in technology I'm going to include education, might be ways to think about where we might want to invest rather than just thinking about the size of population, as you say, and is it office, retail, or industrial? So 
for, for us in uh, looking at Australia, there's massive interest in Perth and Brisbane because of the story around commodities. So cities connected to energy, cities connected to commodities, and cities connected to technology, including education, would be areas to consider. And then just coming on to the point about how do places feel, it was interesting that the Marina Bay Financial Centre mm -hmm. in Singapore got the most votes. I live in Singapore, I've been living there for five years now. And what I only recently found out, I'm a big fan of the URA, which does the master planning for Singapore. And they've got a fantastic model that's well worth the trip to go and see it at the Maxwell Road Centre. They have place managers, which is something that resorts like Disney World have. And the job of the place manager is to make sure that the immediate environment feels nice for visitors. And Singapore employs as civil servants place managers whose job it is downtown, down around the Marina Bay area to make sure that the place feels nice, just like Disney would have them, to make sure that if your visitors are there, the loos are clean, the bins are empty, people can get from A to B, and they employ people to do that. And, you know, I, I think we can learn a lot from Singapore um, in terms of leisure facilities, in terms of ethnic mix in their housing estates, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a city that has brought together different ethnic groups that are living together in harmony and, and have Disney-style place managers to make sure that the visitors are happy. So it was, just, it was an interesting thing that came up. And then the conference continues on the website of MIPEM Asia, where you will find uh, summaries and videos of all the panels that, that you wished you might have, att have attended had you not been busy doing business. So thank you so much for taking the time this morning to join us. And then please continue the conversation just outside the door. Thank you. Thank you.